Good afternoon. Welcome to the second uh, track in our 60th annual seminar on glass. I'm delighted to welcome everyone back. I hope you had a nice little break over the lunch hour, joined one of our community rooms, and are ready for a very exciting uh, afternoon series of presentations. Um, this afternoon's theme is community engagement, and it is a topic that is um, extremely uh, relevant, I think, in, in museum practice across the world today. And uh, to help us understand that a little better, um, we're delighted uh, to welcome Salvador Acevedo uh, as our keynote speaker. Salvador is deeply interested in the commonalities that connect people and communities and works to help organizations increase diversity, deepen inclusion, and advance equity. For more than 20 years as an executive consultant and researcher, he has helped organizations link their design and innovation strategies with ethnically diverse and underserved populations. Recent museum collaborations include his work with the Hunting Library, Huntington Library Art Museum and Botanical Gardens, the Oakland Museum of California, SF MoMA, Exploratorium, the California Academy of Sciences and the Children's Discovery Museum. Among his research initiatives, the Latino Experience in Museum Study and the Cultural Anchors Assessment are particularly notable. Both have the goal of helping informal education organizations, such as museums, understand and engage diverse audiences. He's a founding member of the Emerging Leaders of Color Network managed by the Western States Art Federation with the goal of increasing people of color leadership in policy and arts administration. His keynote address today will explore how community engagement can inform and reframe museum programs. Please join me in warmly welcoming this afternoon our keynote speaker, Salvador Acevedo. Thank you so much, Carol Ann, and very happy to be here. I, uh, Carol Ann and I were talking in the backstage just a minute ago, and she was sharing me how this format has been a tremendous uh, opportunity for a lot of people to participate. So I think one of the great things that we've learned uh, because of the pandemic is that we can do these kind of uh, engagements, and uh, I'm all about it. So uh, really happy uh, to be with you. Uh, I recently had an opportunity to visit the Corning Museum of Glass and I was really impressed with uh, the kind of interpretation and the kind of uh, thinking uh, they have around community engagement. And uh, my presentation, uh, it's gonna be about sharing some uh, of my ideas around uh, what we mean by community engagement, basically based on the uh, what I think is a fact that when we say community engagement, we all think that we're in agreement, that we're on the same page, uh, but in reality, I think there's a lot of um, different points of view of what we mean by community engagement. And as Carol Ann said, this is a topic, um, I would say also a trend that we're seeing uh, gaining more and more importance in the museum field, certainly in the US, but also uh, in many other regions, I would say worldwide. Uh, that really rethink what is the relationship that we have with the public, with our audiences, with the people that we intend uh, to serve and to engage. And I think a lot of this uh, switch uh, started probably in the early 2000s uh, with what is known as the participatory museum uh, movement. Many of you are probably familiar with this idea uh, in which museums started to think, how can we connect with people in the way that not only people learn, but also the way that people transform things. Uh, 
uh, we've been talking about experiences uh, in museums for a long time, and now we are also entering into a new realm, uh, which is how we transform things together, all the way from transforming ideas and uh, an interpretation to actually change things, manipulate things, um, and and. I think museum uh, programming is always uh, trying to connect with what is important uh, for people. So let's uh, start by uh, doing some definitions. So if we can, I can get get my next uh, slide, please. Um, so just doing a very simple uh, Google search, I found these two different definitions of what community engagement is. Uh, one, the first one comes from Penn State. The second one is from the American Alliance of Museums. So I'm just gonna read each one of them. Uh, first, the pro uh, community engagement is the process of working collaboratively with and through groups of people affiliated by geographic proximity, special interests, or similar situations to address issues affecting the well being of those people. For me, one of the things that stands out in this definition is that the main interest, the purpose of community engagement, is focused on the community, affecting the well being of those people. So we are engaging these communities, we are working with these communities in, uh, uh, with the interest of improving uh, their lives, their uh, situation. The second one says, individual museums work with their communities to assess their relevance and create a plan to deepen the relationship with the community. In turn, increasing the sustainability of the museum. Coming from American Alliance of Museums, uh, which is a service organization uh, for the museum field here in the US, I don't think it is surprising that the emphasis in this case is in the, with the museum. Uh, the last part of this definition says in turn, increasing the sustainability of the museum, which is kind of the, the main goal uh, in this definition. So these are just two examples of how, and I would say probably we can think about uh, two extremes of one continuum in which uh, we have different ideas of what community engagement is and what is the purpose. I think in, in specifically in this case, we're talking about what is the purpose of community engagement. So if we go to the next slide, uh, I'm gonna focus now on what levels of community engagement can we consider? And specifically, I would say, what are the definitions that we have of community? Because oftentimes, again, we say community, and I personally think that community is a, a word that we overuse. And in many, many cases, it has lost its meaning because we use it so frequently in so many different contexts and with dif different connotations that at the end of the day, we don't really have clarity on what we mean by that. So in some cases, when we talk about community, we're talking about the public. You know, we say the community, we need to bring the community to the museum. We need to bring the community to our programs. And what we mean by that is the public at large, everybody that could be from everybody who lives in the region where we are at to everybody in the country or everybody in the world sometimes. And this little arrow that I put on the public, what I mean by that is that usually the communication that I can establish with the public is a one-way communication. Usually we, the museum, communicate to the public. Then in a more uh, restricted uh, way, we also talk about community to mean audiences, people who actually engage with 
the museum with us. And this engagement sometimes uh, is restricted to the building where we are at, but uh, more and more we're seeing that the role of museums has start to change and we are you now going out of the building and engaging people online, et cetera, et cetera. So for the sake of this argument, we can talk about a broad definition of audiences which is basically everybody that we interact with, that we touch at some point. In marketing, we use the word touch point uh, to refer to any kind of contact that we make with a person. And again, generally, uh, our communication with audiences is a one way. But then in a more, uh, again, uh, focused way, we can talk about partners, uh, you know, more and more uh, museums are partnering with community-based organizations, with other museums, with uh, service providers, uh, with service organizations, uh, etc., to plan uh, exhibits, programming, uh, etc. So sometimes when we talk about community, we we're talking about those partners, and the big difference here is that in a partnership, there must be a two-way communication. We are listening as much as we are uh, talking. So there's a whole lot of different things that emerge when we have a two-way communication. And then at the very core, uh, what we have is what we call co-designers. Uh, people that we are actually sharing um, ownership, sharing responsibility, sharing decision-making uh, power. And in those cases, uh, communities are very, very small. We don't usually share that level of collaboration with, with a lot of uh, different people. So this is just an example of different things or different levels of uh, community of what we mean by community. Next slide, please. And on the same token, uh, when we talk about engagement, we are also talking about many different things. So for these, I uh, want to share with you a model that was, uh, that has been uh, developing for the last uh, several years, which is called the three C's. Uh, the spectrum of community engagement practices. And here, what we have is different ways of engaging, different ways of collaborating with uh, our partners, our uh, communities in general. So first we have a contribution, which is a situation in which an external stakeholder uh, to the museum a particular community of interest, a, a particular group, a particular person uh, could be contributes something to uh, the museum. So if we use an exhibit development as an example, and let's say that we are uh, working on an exhibit of artifacts from uh, Vietnam during the war era, and uh, in our community, there's a family uh, who are immigrants from Vietnam and they have some artifacts that uh, they can uh, lend to the museum for that particular exhibit. So they contribute those artifacts uh, to the, the exhibit. So that is a contribution. They are sharing something that uh, belongs to them, that um, they have a point of view, but they are not contributing necessarily interpretation, just uh, the, the, the artifact, the uh, idea, the, um, the service. Then on the next step, which is a little bit more involved, we have collaboration in which that is external stakeholder not only contributes with something, but also collaborates with the museum 
usually in interpretation or in making decisions about how we are going to approach this uh, particular uh, topic, this particular idea. So we uh, get to um, create some new ideas on a limited uh, base. And then uh, the next step or the next uh, type of uh, engagement is what we call co-creation. And this is a situation in which the decision-making power, ownership, responsibility falls squarely on both um, the, the, the museum and its partners. So all decisions are made uh, jointly all decisions, the approach, the interpretation, the uh, decision uh, are made uh, together. So next uh, slide, please. What, what we know is that as we move from different types of engagement, uh, as I've been saying, ownership and decision-making power increases. Uh, to the point that in co-creation, it's a completely shared uh, decision-making power. In ownership, there's, uh, sorry, in contribution, there's very little decision-making uh, power and collaboration is kind of a combination of both. Obviously, from a community engagement uh, point of view, uh, from a, from a, uh, uh, the idea of collaborating, uh, co-creation is an ideal, but I think uh, in general, it has created a lot of uh, resistance within museums because the idea of co-creation generally is seen as we are gonna ignore the expertise of museum professionals and give a uh, preference to the live experiences of community partners. And I think that idea is it's what it has created this resistance to think about community engagement, but I really think that is not the case. I think in a, in a true co-creation, uh, a relationship, both sides are uh, respected and both sides have uh, a particular um, uh, focus, a particular way of interacting. So next slide, please. So that particular space is what we call the decision uh, space, uh, which is particularly important in co-creation, but it's also important in any other uh, of the other two types of, of uh, engagement. We need to define, we need to really make clear what is the decision-making space that we're going to share with our partners. And uh, this is something that ideally we define, we clarify from the very beginning. So talking about that tension between live experience and academic uh, expertise or professional expertise, we need to understand how those two can create the best possible synergy without cl uh, clashing with each other. So for that, uh, defining what are the, the, the things in which we are going to share a decision uh, making power is important. And usually uh, a lot of these decisions are made based on where financial resources come from, which I think is a mistake because uh, yes, financial resources are important and people who have those resources usually want to have control over the, the, the enterprise, the collaboration, but we cannot ignore that community capital is 
equally important, which means that uh, maybe our partner doesn't have the financial resources, but they have a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of community connections that are shaping the, uh, the collaboration itself, which is incredibly important also. Uh, so again, we need to really define what we are gonna be, how we're gonna be collaborating. And ideally uh, we define that early on in the process. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, some community engagement principles that I've gathered over time working with different uh, organizations, uh, working with different uh, museums. The first one is to move at this, the speed of trust. Uh, what this means is that we need to respect uh, and understand that trust is something that takes time uh, to develop. Trust cannot be uh, developed based on a timeline or based just on uh, some uh, uh, tactical uh, actions or activities. Uh, trust is very much uh, an emotional, it has an emotional component, uh, an intellectual component and a behavioral uh, component. So it takes time to gain the, the trust of the communities that we are working with. And if we are working with communities with different cultural norms, we need to really understand what those cultural norms are. So I'm gonna to move to the third uh, bullet point, uh, which is learn about cultural norms. Question your assumptions of how things should work. Uh, you know, when, uh, when we work with ethnic uh, communities, when we work with uh, communities that have a certain affinity with we work with uh, age uh, uh, faces, uh, communities based on age uh, faces, etc. Pretty much every every different uh, community would have their own cultural norms. Mainly, what I mean by this is that they have their own way of working. They have their own way of interpreting things and they have their own values. And we need to understand what is important for them so we can create a really uh, fruitful uh, collaboration. Not everybody is interested in your timeline. Not everybody is interested in your uh, grant uh, constrictions. Not everybody is uh, interested in your calendar, programming calendar. And I've seen uh, things like uh, people trying to establish a partnership because they have this program that is coming in three months and, uh, and they want to do a joint programming. And the people on the other side of the table said, hold on, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, ethnic communities has, uh, have experienced an uptick, a huge uptick of uh, organizations uh, reaching out to them, uh, searching for uh, partnerships and collaborations. And all of a sudden, they're spending so much time in these partnerships that they cannot do their own work, uh, especially when that work is not compensated. So things like that, or a very simple one, but that creates a lot of really uh, uh, conflicts is what sense of time do we have? You know, in a very uh, Western white uh, led uh, culture, we are used to say, this thing starts at 10 and finishes at 11. 
not all people think uh, of time that way. People think we are meeting and the meeting starts when the elder shows up or starts when uh, we all have a chance to connect emotionally and we create the, 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 the appropriate environment to share our ideas, et cetera. So all those things we need to, to, to consider. I'm going now to my second bullet point, which is develop empathy. Uh, so empathy, as opposed to just understanding, and this is totally connected with what I uh, just said, it has to do with putting yourself in the shoes of uh, the other person. So that implies a lot of emotional connection. So it's not only about understanding those audiences, those communities that we're trying to, to, to engage, uh, but also putting ourselves in their shoes. How would they plan, for example, a festivity, a festival, if you were in their shoes, then if you're just thinking the way that you usually do it. Uh, and what are the, the, the ideas, what are the purposes of those, uh, of those uh, plans? And uh, lastly, uh, just to uh, go back to the decision uh, space, uh, define the decision space early in the process. Again, I think it is crucial to make sure that we all are uh, clear on what are the things that we are going to share decision-making uh, uh, power, what are the things that are responsibilities from one of the partners, what are responsibilities from the other partner, so all these things, and these, I think, should be a discussion, should be a, a collaboration to decide what is the, uh, the decision uh, space. So we just have a couple of minutes. I'm just uh, wondering, Carol Ann, if maybe there's some comments in the chat or uh, maybe Carol Ann, you want no. to... Uh, ask a question or make a comment. Um, thank you, Salvador. Um, are we on your last slide or do you have more to go? There are no questions no. at the moment. Okay, no, that's the last slide. Okay, great. Um, so thank you so much. We um, uh, had the pleasure of working with Salvador um, about a month ago at our museum. And um, I think some of his comments by, by looking at the model that he creates for us, the 3C spectrum, um, it helps us place ourselves um, in our thinking and in our acting against, against that. And, and I wonder in your work with other institutions, if you know, presenting that model at the start gives you a starting block. And I think um, you know, this afternoon's programs, we're gonna hear two more sessions uh, about community engagement. The first will be two perspectives from uh, two other museum institutions and their uh, activity related to community engagement. And then the second program is with um, principals of the Haudenosaunee community, artists and uh, museum professionals and their views on their own work, and how that is placed in their own museums or in museums um, that are more uh, part of the um, white, uh, you know, larger uh, institutional uh, footprint that you referenced. So I'm wondering in your current work with institutions, um, where is the starting block? When can someone start? What does readiness look like, I guess, is my question. Yeah, I think it always, I mean, I think you need to start where you are at because uh, mm -hmm. every museum has been doing this work for a long time. It has changed what we are trying to do, but I think it's always uh, crucial to really take a moment to do kind of an inventory of your assets. Uh, I, would, I would call it that way. Uh, what are the, the, the connections that we have? Uh, an example comes to, to my mind really quick. 
Uh, years ago, I started working with a large organization and we were uh, talking about uh, Latino engagement in that specific case. And we were having all these plans, et cetera, et cetera. So we uh, identify an organization, a community organization that we wanted to partner with. And when we went and met with them, they said, oh yes, you're from this organization. We've been working with this person for 10 plus years. And the leadership, at this organization didn't know that there was this go, uh, ongoing partnership with this organization for a long time. So by doing an inventory and, and, uh, uh, of what are the, 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 the relationships that we already have in the community, and some of them might be unknown for leadership, mm. which, is, which is an important thing, um, I think. We, that that's that that should be the first step. Just checking if I had my mute on. Um, <laughs> sorry. There's there's um, a question from our audience, Salvador. I know that we're almost at time, but do you have time to answer one question? I do. Yes. Oh, okay. Good. Um, uh, he says, thanks for this. Uh, I'm wondering if you can say more about employees doing this work in arenas outside of normal office hours and compensated time and how museums can elevate their value in this work internally. Well, uh, I think that is, that is an internal uh, question. And uh, one of the things that I uh, realized early on in my uh, in working with with museums is that uh, the real work happens inside the institution, not outside. Engaging communities, uh, reaching out to uh, different audiences, uh, bringing new people is relatively easy work changing the internal culture of an organization to really respond to the needs of changes in society, that's the, the, the most uh, oftentimes difficult work. So changing the internal culture, accommodating for changes in society is, is, is something that needs to, to happen. Systemic change is important, is, mm -hmm. is hugely uh, important. So we need to identify what are the things that we need to change internally in order to respond to the needs of changing, changes in society in general. Yeah, it, it draws me back, um, Salvador, to your one of your starting slides where you put the two examples of um, definition, one from Penn State and one from AAM. Um, and it, it brought to mind, well, what are each, inst each institution has to do the work that you're just saying, looking internally, what are the change we want to make? What is the change we want to make or see in the world, um, mm -hmm. as the quote goes? And, you know, how do we want to participate in that? So a lot of um, thought process and perhaps facilitated conversation around what are we trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. For whom? Um, exactly. It is maybe you know a, a question, and then if you have that question, if you can clarify institutionally what that question is you're trying to answer, and then we start looking at your models, we see where we are in there and where the work might begin. Um, mm -hmm. For me, that that seems like a progression that um, is is possible. Yeah. So uh, answering more directly to to this question, I think. Uh, museum in, in general internally needs to understand what does it mean to work with these communities and what does imply and it oftentimes implies after hours because that's when uh people in our our partners have time to meet maybe we're talking about an organization that it's all volunteers so they don't have time during the work hours and uh, and uh, weekends are uh, oftentimes also uh, the time that it's needed and resources, etc. So we need to accommodate for for that. We need to have that flexibility. Exactly. Um, well, I think we are out of time, and I'm I'm uh, 
conscious of our ongoing schedule, the drumbeat of each of the next sessions. Um, I can't thank you enough, Salvador, for joining us today. It's uh, been a pleasure and I'm sure enlightening for many of the people who are with us. And I think uh, the perfect stopping, stepping off point for the two sessions this afternoon. Um, people can navigate to those through the uh, lobby of the conference site. And um, I hope you enjoyed Salvador as much as I did and learn uh, each time we meet. Thank you so much.